everybody. Welcome to Rachel's Reviews. And today we are again talking about the new season of Schmigadoon. And we're talking about season two, episodes one and two, Schmigago. We're diving right into it. And uh, I am film critic Rachel Wagner and theater critic. And uh, Marin Swenson is here. Hello. And Adam Cannon is here. Hello. And uh, I'm excited to talk to both of you about this new premiere uh, that we got. Uh, and uh, we're, we, I didn't know that they'd be giving us the two episodes. So we were originally only going to cover one, but then they gave us both. So it's going to be fun to kind of dive in and talk about it, talk about them both. Uh, but we have our recap of season one. If people uh, want to go back, I'll put a link in the description. Yeah. People can listen to that if you want to hear our thoughts on season one. And uh, so the summary for this first episode is even though they found love after leaving Schmigadoon, Josh and Melissa's relationship has hit another bump. So they attempt to find Schmigadoo again, they end up in another world based on musicals from the 60s through the 80s, Chicago. So, Marin, overall, what do you think of this premiere, this first episode? So, it's actually really funny. I actually ended up watching it twice because I watched it the first time. And then my husband, he was like, wait, you watched it without me? <laughs> I was like, well, um, I had to for the podcast. And so we actually ended up watching it again this afternoon because he oh, was like, funny. how dare you watch it without me? I'm like, oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh i actually really really enjoyed it mostly for the parody because of how well they did parody all of these other shows just the opening number being such a parody of pippin which is not a um it's not a popular show around Utah. I have to would have to say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is a popular show, but it's not done very often in Utah. But my sister did it at Clearfield High when she was. Well, she still is a teacher there, but she she did it um, there years and years ago, and that was the first time I had seen it. And then then of course it was revived on Broadway not too long ago. But it's just not done around here very much, and and so I love it, and I'm like one of the only people I know who's like, oh yeah, I love Pippin. Mm -hmm. And so to have that opening number be so very much like Pippin and then having um Cecily Strong's character explain things all the time like I loved how she was like oh sometimes in these types of shows they have a narrator instead of a story that like I laughed so yeah. hard when she said that so I really enjoyed the parody I thought they had taken it to the next level which I had to wonder how could they do better than Schmigadoon but I just feel like yeah they they took took the mo mockery up one level yeah I mean I definitely felt not having seen Pippin, I definitely felt that uh, because I, I mean, I looked up the on Broadway.com, they had a kind of a list of all the different references and there were a lot of Pippin and I'm like, I got to find a way to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be something on YouTube or something. Uh, but uh, I did watch Cabaret because I just, I, after I watched the episodes, I was like, I'm missing so much. The fact I, 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 I hadn't seen I hadn't seen the movie at least mm -hmm. and I guess the movie is pretty different yeah than, than the than, state version yeah yeah um but I found out I was I I messaged to both of you I found out that University of Utah is doing cabaret this month which is kind of crazy right uh, and uh, so I'm definitely gonna go see that uh and uh and so that will be cool but um uh, Adam what did you think overall of the um of the premiere so it was tough for me because I am of the old school and new school musical type. I, mm -hmm. I don't know much about this genre of musicals. In fact, the only reference I got was the reference to Bye Bye Birdie. Mm. Uh, the Conrad. The, the Conrad. And I thought that was quite hilarious and 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 clever the way they did that. But mm -hmm. um, I, I also, thinking back on it, was a little worried about what audience they were shooting at. Because with the original... There are lots of folks like my family who would sort of enjoy it, even though it still had kind of the adult humor and things like that. They 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 would enjoy it because almost everybody knows those old musicals. Sound yeah. of Music, Oklahoma, Music Man, Brigadoon, things like that. Yeah. This new bunch, this new season seemed devoted to the musical theater devotees. Mm -hmm. So there's that there's that big chunk of audience that I wonder if they're going to lose. I mean, it still was great in terms of the storytelling 
And yeah. I love uh, I love the inclusion of Titus Burgess as the narrator and, uh, and yes. all that stuff. And I think there's there's a lot of people who may stick with it because yeah. they, they because it's a good story and it's and it's catchy and, and dramatic and whatever. But I think they may also I, I worry that they may lose a few people who are like, wait, I don't understand all this music now. It's much more much more adult, like some of those mm -hmm. those sort of mid-range musicals are, or, the, or that mm -hmm. genre of mm -hmm. musicals are. And so it's, but but I, I mean, I enjoyed it. I didn't catch any of the song references. <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've listened to those soundtracks from those, from those musicals sort of on my Spotify, just kind of here and there in the background, but mm -hmm. I don't know chicago or pippin or any of those well enough and so i'm hoping that as it goes i may i may get into some of the some of the stuff i recognize but either way i enjoyed the episodes because mm -hmm. i you know i thought the acting was good and the storytelling was good and it's it's kind yeah. of in line with that but yeah so that that was sort of my thoughts yeah i think it's gonna be interesting because i think we have like the full spectrum because i think marion you're probably the most knowledgeable about all of these shows and i'm probably yeah. in the middle somewhere because i've seen company i've seen screening todd i've seen a few of these but there's a lot that i haven't seen um and then you know kind of and then somebody who is really new to to these shows and to see if they are it's fun on that level but is it also fun and entertaining and are the songs genuinely good on their own without them being homages to uh, is it just a, oh it's like that is it sounds right. like that it looks like that is it is it good on its own and so I think that's actually going to be really helpful to have all three perspectives I think uh, it, in looking at these you know I look at it and I think if I were to stumble across this as as a new viewer and not know anything about Schmigadoon season one mm -hmm. um, I it's enjoyable on its own but what I sort of struggled with, and I think what some of my family would struggle with, they haven't watched it, um, right. would be, I struggled with constantly trying to figure out what this was referencing. Like yeah. I, there was supposed to be, I was supposed to be catching stuff that I wasn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, and there was stuff <laughs> that until I read the article that I, I didn't catch because I haven't seen Sweet Charity. I haven't seen uh pippin i haven't seen jesus christ superstar i mean there's just ones that i just don't know and uh so right. right so my husband he has come to like like he knew some musicals before me he had played like in the pit in high school and that mm -hmm. sort of thing but he was not he's not like the big musical goer until he married me five years ago <laughs> and then got stuck being my plus one many many times <laughs> that's the and, dream <laughs> yeah yeah, pretty much. Um, and and he has really enjoyed it. But yeah, there was a lot of things where I was like explaining a lot of what's been going on, where I would be like, oh, well, that is with this or that is with that. And I would be telling him like how the very first um, cabaret type number with the girls was almost exactly the do we shock you that number mm -hmm. is almost exactly sweet charities. Um, from one of the sweet charity numbers and I was explaining to him and and but what he was saying to me because I was asking him a little bit after because he he didn't even know what sweet charity was mm -hmm. uh, but he was saying that they they've done a good job of also making it funny on its own because that that scene was so funny because yeah in the 70s when sweet charity came out that was a shocking show but now you know how Cecily and um Keegan their characters are like no that's not shocking you know because it's mm -hmm. not today. the things that they were singing about aren't shocking anymore and so it's interesting to look back mm. at some of the musicals now and think okay those were edgy and shocking back then but are they so much anymore yeah not that's so much true. so that was funny that they were just like uh you know when they point and they say look there's that guy in that dress and then cecily says yeah i uh, i watch all seasons of drag race like whatever mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. that's true and so the thing with titus burgess I, were narrators like so common because i think about most of those shows that we're talking about they don't have narrators so um in pippin especially they have um the main character is called the leading player and um he is the narrator well and it's actually he and she because if you want to have a little bit i'll just vomit out some 
theater um, <laughs> knowledge for you. Um, Pippin is the only musical to have given a Tony Award to both a male and a female for best um, um, best leading actor or actress in a musical for the same character, but in the original it was Ben Vereen. And then in the revival, it was Patina Miller. They both got oh. the Tony because in the original, a male played the leading player. And then in the revival, a female played the leading player. And that leading player serves as the narrator. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum it is the, um, I can't remember the name of the mm -hmm. main character, but they serve kind of as the narrator. And then there's, there's several others where there is a main character that does kind of serve as a narrator type. Um, they don't always name it as a narrator. And Jesus Christ Superstar, it's Judas, mm -hmm. serves as a narrator of the show. It was, and then in Joseph, that's the other one. I'm like, there's one that, yeah, oh, Joseph yeah. has a narrator. Um, it was very much a trope of the 60s and 70s to have a narrator kind of guide you through the show. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. And uh, and so I I like when they get to Schmigadoon because they talk, they're trying to get pregnant and she's getting really sad about uh, the IVF being unsuccessful and all those things and uh, she has to show people their their baby's foot foot uh, every day and uh, just getting sad uh, and I like it was a there were some funny jokes I thought when she says um. Maybe it's Schmigadoon is a place you only go once and never return, like Soul Cycle. Right, right. Those are pretty good. <laughs> uh -huh. And it's the tale of Josh and Melissa here on the quest for the most elusive treasure of all, happiness. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, Adam, what do you think about Josh and Melissa? Do you think that they like have chemistry and you're invested in them, their story? They have a they have a weird sort of chemistry. Mm -hmm. it's a, uh, there were there have been times all throughout that I've sort of fought with do they have the chemistry, but I think they 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 pulled it off really well in the first season, and then in the second season, I'm waiting to see because yeah. you know, obviously they fell in love at the end of at the end of you know season one. Spoiler alert. Mm -hmm. um, you know and then they they this season two starts with you know like you said them getting married and then you know them sort of spending time together and then some of that is sort of the newness is worn off and you know they're told that their quest now is not to find true love but to find a happy ending and so I look at that as someone who's been married 30 plus years and I think you know there are lots of couples out there who've been married for a while but the shine has sort of worn off Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see how that chemistry will develop if we will see you know already we see her sort of putting everything on the line for him as he's uh, as he's you know in jail and, and whatever and and you know trying to save him but uh, you know I, there were still some times that I sort of felt like there was some of it that was sort of given up for comedy in the name of you know some chemistry mm -hmm. given up for comedy and it, I don't know. It's it's an interesting pairing, and I think it's more real that way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like these two are just automatically two people who would be perfectly matched. And I love that they did that in the first season, and that they sort of strayed and then came back and found each other and and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Yeah, because the the original season was kind of about critiquing and poking fun at at traditional romance, traditional the traditional family, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, whereas this is more about uh, them kind of the, all these, I mean, this era of musicals, it was all about, uh, it was all about critiquing those relationships. So it's almost like this is a, a double layer kind of on top of that critiquing the critique. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Uh, and as you're talking about that, the critiquing of the critique, Rachel, it makes me think of, you know, like I am a, I'm a theater critic, but I'm also a therapist. That's my day job. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, and somewhat why I like some of these, I like some of the deeper and the darker musicals. Um, it makes me think of you and I, Rachel, we got to see company, um, on Broadway the, when we were there, uh, mm -hmm. a year ago, it was a year ago now. Yeah. Um, 
and the ending, the whole climax of company, because company really is an awful lot about just how miserable a lot of people are. Like it has like all these like, <laughs> like, like different um, storylines of couples who are miserable. And then this single person who's searching for their life, their their life partner or whatever else. Um, but the the climax, the song at the end, being alive, it is just talking about how that that's the if you dig deep, that's the point of life is not necessarily the the finding happiness or anything else. It's just the experience of life, just the experience of being alive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, it will be interesting to see how this storyline goes because it's very into the woods is the next decade. So it's too soon to say this, but it's very much like if you look at the history of musical theater into the woods is the first act is very, you know, the, the happily ever after. And then the second act is the not so happily ever after. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that's kind of where we're at. We're in the second act of into the woods. And now we're looking at, you know, the, the t challenges and the downfalls and the pitfalls of life. And so it's very kind of meta. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that I found interesting was was just exactly that, that we are into the sort of second half of Into the Woods, and yet their quest, apparently given to them by the Leprechaun, is to find the one thing that most of these musicals don't have, is that mm -hmm. happy ending. Right, you know, exactly. Most of us, mm -hmm. most of us, you know, have the musicals we enjoy, at least kind of the, the lay theater goer says, I love Sound of Music and Oklahoma and Music Man or whatever, because they're happy. And right. They well, and they, they end the way they're supposed to, and things like that, and and too many of these musicals don't. And so I'm sitting there thinking to myself, as he gives them that quest, why in the world are they are we choosing these musicals to have them go on? And so I'm interested to see where it goes from here. Right, and that's what she said too. She's like, but most of these musicals don't end happily, so how in the world? And, I, and that's where, you know, again, as a, a psychologist and whatever, I think, okay, this will be really interesting because that's where you have to dig deeper and start thinking, how, how does it? Because to me, Into the Woods has one of the strongest moral endings too, where they talk about even in the darkest, you know, no one is alone. And so I think that sometimes you can still find happiness in some of the most sorrowful places. Some of my very favorite songs come from Pippin, actually like one of my very, very favorite songs about like joy in life comes from Pippin. It's one that the grandma sings. Um, and so it's interesting because yes, these are the sad, the more difficult shows, but I can find happiness in them if I dig through it. And so mm -hmm. well, there's um, like a certain catharsis from yeah. going through this sort of experience. I actually just saw company on Friday at, at the Empress and Magna. Oh, okay. And uh, it was really they did a great job i mean it's an amateur production but they gave it their all and uh and there is something about having that like shared experience uh of seeing a show like that together and uh, all kind of having different interpretations and then talking about it with people next to you and all that it's it's a uh there's something special about these kinds of shows that are a little bit a little bit deeper a little bit darker they have something to kind of talk about right are you a fan of Rachel's reviews? Do you look forward to Family Movie Night, female film critics panels, or the Talking Disney podcast? If so, please consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron. As a patron, you get to access monthly events such as the watch alongs and Q and A's, where you get to talk to stars and find out the behind the scenes of the movie making industry. And you can pick what I review for Family Movie Night or even become a guest on the podcast. Podcasts and YouTube channels are expensive and I really, really could use your help. I would so appreciate it. You also get to be a member of the Facebook group where we talk about all the films that we're seeing and we have so much fun. Go to patreon.com slash hallmarkies and select one of the Rachel's fan tiers. That's patreon.com slash hallmarkies. Say that in like a lot of those early shows have some really dark elements in them like Carousel and, and Oklahoma and things like that. Yeah, but, um, for sure. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but uh, it's it's an interesting experience to kind of go through together because I think because it is more challenging, like it's darker. It it uh, it's it, you just have to. It, there's something kind of almost unsettling about seeing something that's like a little bit risque, a little bit a little bit more challenging. So I, I think I am a little bit concerned in this first episode that there are certain things that it's like, okay, you've done that joke a number of times, like the I'll drink to that. 
It's like, what are you doing with, is that like, are you going to do anything with that character? Or is she literally just going to be there to say that over and over and over again? Right. I think that that might just become the running joke of the season for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Which is from company that, that character. Um, So we have Dove Cameron. She is playing a character named Jenny Banks instead of Betsy. And this is a reference to Sally Bowles in Cabaret, evidently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, her look is very, very much like that. And uh, I like when she said, how are men in charge of anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he didn't recognize her. Yeah, yeah. that was good. Uh, and then we get the do do we scare you number. And so that was that was pretty, I thought, a pretty good number. And we let, we meet Octavius Craft who owns a club played by patrick page Mm -hmm. i love him so much and then there's the dead body in the dressing room so that's when the plot kind of starts to to go and he says this is not the kind of musical i want to be in (laughs) (laughs) um and then as you said adam we get the leprechaun uh, and I was kind of surprised to get him back. I, I'm surprised how many people they were able to get back because the first one Broadway was closed, so they could they could have their pick of anybody, you know. And uh, so I was worried the second season that they might have a harder time getting people, uh-huh. but evidently not. So that's good. I liked what they did with that, where you mm-hmm. know, too many times, you know, when they do a, a something like this. Uh, especially if it's a, like a different place. This is Chicago versus Shemega Dune. I was wondering if they were going to call out that, hey, this person looks like this person from Shemega Dune. And, and they just played right into that. You know, hey, that's mm-hmm. so, you know, that's her. And don't you recognize her and him and, and all that stuff? I, I really liked that they just played it up as though, okay, now we're both in a musical. We know this is weird. We've been through this before and we're seeing the same people play the same things because. You know, it, it could have gone the other way and it would have been a little, you know, disconcerting maybe. Mm-hmm. For the audience. Yeah, they also talk about the fact that this d- era used imperfect rhyme. <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> and it's not okay. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you explain a little bit what that what they're talking about there? So but- she was talking about how things like you might rhyme time with fine and that that was that was a very common trope that they would do like rhymes weren't it it was it's again just this idea that we went from the perfect view and look of musicals musicals being so clean and precise to musicals being more dark and so everything was including the rhymes were not perfect and so it it was just a shift in the theater industry in general. And a lot of musical theater purists just did not like that. It, it, it Even if you read old critiques of the time, people who were critics in the 40s and 50s really got upset in the 60s and 70s that, oh, we weren't doing things the way that they used to. And it's just funny because anytime some kind of medium changes, it's the same thing over and over again. We don't like change. We don't like things to be different. And and the thing that's funny is, I, I think you just said it a minute ago, Rachel, that, um, you know, there were still really dark things. I mean, when you look at Oklahoma and Carousel and probably some of the reasons why, you know, last time we talked about how I don't necessarily like the music man, I don't like some of these shows, is because they also have really dark things, but we tend to overlook them because of the happy music and the happy ending and the bright lighting. And it just seems so fun. And so who cares if, you know, Oklahoma and Carousel talk about abuse and stuff and we just overlook it. Yeah. And so I think that sometimes why I can kind of get into a show like Pippin or Chicago or something like that is that, yeah, it's about murder, but they don't, they don't shy away from it. They're telling us right up front that it's about murder. Mm-hmm. You know, like Sweeney Todd is a very dark show, but it tells you right up front that it's about murder and revenge. We know exactly what they're talking to us about. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Whereas I feel like sometimes you can watch Carousel in Oklahoma and leave just thinking about the snappy songs and forgetting that, oh, Curly was kind of a jerk. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. I mean, he sings the whole song about, about uh, uh, what's his name? Kill himself. Wanting, yeah. Wanting Judd to kill himself. And we don't think about <laughs> that, like how terrible that is. 
until I saw the Oklahoma yeah. revival on Broadway, which really, you know, and a lot of people hated it because um, Daniel Fish, who directed it, turned it into what it really was and made it almost like a horror film. Like, I think when I reviewed it on Broadway, I said that it was like um, Oklahoma meets the Blair Witch Project because that's what mm -hmm. it felt like. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were like, this is just not Oklahoma. And it's like, but isn't it? If you really read the story, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. It's interesting. So at the end, Josh ends up getting arrested. And uh, and that's kind of our ending of this episode. So what would you give one to 10? What do you think about this premiere? What do you think, Marin? I would say about an eight. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. I do agree, though. Like I enjoyed it because it was made for me. Mm. Um, like it's it's made for for fans like me. I do wonder about like like my husband enjoyed it because of his connection to me and he likes musicals and stuff. Um, I I can't imagine like I think of one of my brothers in particular. He probably would have been like, uh, yeah, turn it off after the first ten minutes. Yeah. So I, yeah, like like I feel like you lose a particular audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, it, it did so. inspire me. Like I went and watched Cabaret. I got a ticket for Cabaret. Like it definitely inspired me to to learn more and to uh, you know catch up on some of these things. But um, I'd probably give it a seven. Uh, there, I there were like things like the I'll drink to that. Like I don't know. I just felt like. Uh, like let's let's do something with the, like there's more potential with character of joanne to do something fun like are we just gonna have these uh these jokes that don't go anywhere but um but overall right. i enjoyed it i thought it was fun uh and uh you know great cast uh, and great production values i think they definitely got more money this season yeah for sure yeah yeah uh what would you give it adam um I'd probably be in that seven to eight range again. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I like the I like the production value of it. I, I liked you know the the big name stars and the, obviously the numbers are well written. I, I think sometimes too you get into these shows where they're trying to parody or or rewrite familiar tunes, and sometimes it feels like they're stretching. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to have trying to cram something into into fit and it doesn't quite fit but i'm going to cram it anyway and it's going to come off awkward and and ungainly and this this one felt very natural yeah to the point where i've found myself saying gee you know what's the original song and things like that i for one don't mind those running gags like you know the i'll drink to that if they are done well mm -hmm. I mean, you know the muppet any of the muppet movies are filled with them you know they're still with a chef who who pops <laughs> up from time to time or or you know things like that who who just kind of, you know, make an appearance and are there and you don't ever see those characters develop. But it has to be done with good timing and done right. You know, my big my big thing, and, and again, is is just the sort of darker themes. I'm I don't mind shows like this. I mean, I've I've worked on Carousel and I've directed Oklahoma and so and I've seen some of the darkness there, but I think sometimes why people go to the theater is to escape some mm -hmm. of those dark yep. things in their life and they want to come away happy I mean, yeah, right. very true brands with you know we can't stop the beat is uh, despite all the racism and, and things that goes on and it is is it it's ending up victorious and we want the good guy to win you yeah, know true. It, it doesn't happen in real life and so these this era of musicals that's all sort of dark and, and hard is it's hard because we have to want to go to the theater and sort of say okay, I'm going to confront some of these hard things and these hard topics. And I know that I know that they exist in Carousel and Annie and Oklahoma and Music Man and all over the place, but I don't have to deal with them in those shows. I can just enjoy the story and laugh and and sing the toe tapping numbers and whatever. And so it's it's a very different audience. And it's certainly this one, even for, you know, this is definitely more of a, almost a PG-13 or, or or sliding into sort of the TVMA audience with mm -hmm. the costumes and the and the provocativeness and things like that, that I think the other one could get, a, the, the earlier season could get away with, with, you know, I mean, there were still some very adult jokes like the Sound of Music number, um, the Do, right. Re, Mi, the Do Mi, Re Mi parody and things like that. But I think there's, I give it a seven right now, just because I want to see where it goes. 
and I'm I'm curious because I don't know enough about these shows to sort of know where they go. And so I'm curious just looking at it from kind of the, the lay observer of saying, let's see where they take this. Let's see if they make the these humor and the, this humor and these characters enjoyable or if it just sort of falls flat and seems to recycle mm-hmm. kind of the same trope that they've done. Yeah, I I totally get what you're saying. I Mary, do you know how late in the 80s they're gonna go? Like, are I we going to get Les Mis? Are we going to get... No, I'm pretty sure they're going to stop pretty early. I think the only reason that they went even anywhere close in the 80s was for Annie. And I well, I think that's it's something that really people wouldn't notice unless they were paying attention to it. When they were naming all the dancers, they're all the names of the mm-hmm. orphans. The I saw that in the article. Which is hilarious. Oh, and, then, and then Quick Street at the end was a parody from Easy Street. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Okay. But yeah, I think that Annie, which is early, early 80s, like 81 or something like that. I think that that's where they're going to stop because I would think that if they get a third season, the 80s, the the British invasion of it all, the British invasion of Broadway mm-hmm. is going to be able to be a, a season all of itself, you know, so. Yeah, because I mean, it, it does seem like Little Shop of Horrors would be ideal for this season. Yeah, but yeah. And I think that was like that's, 84, 85, something like right, that. Right, that's true. And so so we'll have to see because I haven't heard any of that. It feels like it's more just going to kind of stop early. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. All one, right. Well, yeah, this the one thing I sort of wish is that I kind of wish they would maybe introduce a secondary story, like other characters who stumble into Chicago or whatever, so that if if we go into third and fourth seasons, we're not just following Josh and Melissa all the time. That's true. That would be really interesting, actually. We're following maybe they sort of kind of like the kind of like the Chronicles of Narnia do, where sure. you kind of see the Pevensey family, but then you also see both before and after them how kind of that torch is passed on through and 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 that's I think that would make it more interesting too if they had to they got to see someone else sort of experience their newness and see what they came into because part of me worries about if they go on to season three and four where what other yeah. storylines can we find right will we be even invested in what can they be on sure. to, to sort of tackle sure. yeah I mean and they'd have the problem with uh with some of those shows are still on broad you know when, when they're getting up into the late 80s 90s yeah some so of those shows are still, still on around, broadway yeah. or just leaving broadway and uh and but i mean they could have so much fun with the 90s era i mean think what they could do with cats that and would be rent. hilarious <laughs> right yeah rent mm-hmm. <laughs> but um but anyway um so the next episode episode two doorway to wear and this is as Josh makes a new friend in jail, Melissa hires a lawyer and goes undercover to clear his name. So what did you think of the sec- second episode overall, Marin? Oh my goodness. Okay. So both Topher and um, now I can't even remember the name of the, the Bobby Flanagan character um, are so perfect in their parody. So that doorway to where is a parody of the song "Corner of the Sky" and the sky from Pippin, which is actually a very beautiful song. But some of the lines, oh, um, I was I was rolling. I think to me that was some of the funniest because um, um, there like there are just things like the one of the lines in "Corner of the Sky" is "Cats sit on the windowsill, children play in the snow," and so some of the stuff that he was saying, like you know, like like squirrels and like just pulling all of those random things. It just was really spot on and funny, but he's not just supposed to be the character in um, Pippin. I think they're also trying to have him be one of the characters in hair and everything else. And just like the whole like free love and whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, and I thought that he did it so well. And I really loved how they, like how he kept trying to interrupt their scenes with a song and everything that it's not about you, Topher. <laughs> Because that was my favorite that, not you, Topher. because that happens a lot in these musicals where all of a sudden you're like um why are, why is he singing again like wait a second I thought we were going on this other storyline and <laughs> and 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 now we're back to this guy singing again yeah, <laughs> I, yeah my husband and I both felt that way about Jesus Christ superstar like suddenly like another character would be back to singing and we're like wait a second what what happened to the plot why well, are that's we true at least in 
in the movie of cabaret that's definitely true every yeah. time the mc comes on you're just like what what happened right. to the story right and so for for topher to keep trying to interrupt it was just so telltale of these shows <laughs> because as much as i do like the darker show some of the writing's not as tight um but then jane krakowski's character i if you've not it was seen really funny the movie chicago yeah. that they that won the oscar and everything just the the lawyer character is so spot on with the um jailbirds all singing about her walking in and then her having just all this charisma and everything and expecting that she can win her case based on charisma and everything just just that is that is chicago that's Mm -hmm. everything that's yeah and i i saw chicago for the first time the very first trip i went to new york and um so i saw it with the original revival cast and Mm. And so that, you know, and that was like, really like, that's what it was. It's just this star studded. You're not really supposed to care about the plot. You're not really supposed to care about the fact that these stories are outlandish and outrageous. You're supposed to care about all the glitz and all the glamour and all the dancing. And that's what that whole number portrayed. And so it really like, to me, just took it all up another notch and saying, this is exactly what we're trying to do here is just take these crazy stories and then again it the same thing with the press conference where oh it's jazz it's all jazz like just it was it was perfect well and I like Josh when he says I pretend to like jazz just like everyone else yes <laughs> that was funny. exactly we'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast it's the Hallmarkies merch store are you looking for that perfect gift for the postable hardy or hallmarky in your life What about getting that t-shirt or hoodie that will help you stand out at your next holiday party? Now is the time to check out the Hallmarkies merch store. Full of festive designs by artists like Jessica Miller, Carrie from Hallmark Comics, and more. You can even have more than just shirts, but totes, cell phone cases, notebooks, mugs, and more. And it isn't just Hallmark. We have designs for Anna Green Gables, Man from Snowy River, The Nanny, and more. Every purchase at the merch store goes to help support the podcast and allows us to make the great content you know and love. There are frequent sales, so go to tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies or see the link in the description. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies. But uh, but what did you think, Adam, overall the second episode? Um, Again, it's, it's, you know, it's good. It stands by itself. I love the Topher character to keep trying to, you know, introduce him his his bits in there and um you know the, uh, the some of the songs were just uh, like i said they they stand alone even without knowing the references mm-hmm. i love the song when when jane krakowski's character bobby or whatever is coming into the jail to talk to josh and there was that whole great number there that i was like this is such a great song even if i don't know the reference to it you mm-hmm. know it, it was so much fun and it's, you know, I, it sort of felt like it was trying to rush through some of the Melissa backstory of how she gets there and, and what she does. You know, I, I feel like sometimes they're they're giving up a little bit of story for song. Mm-hmm. But you know, I think in, in, in some cases that's okay. So, it, but it'll be interesting to see where it goes. You know, I'm, I'm curious to see what happens and, and, and what becomes of it. And I certainly, you know, it, it left me, left me saying okay i'm ready to you know to watch what what comes next and and you know see what's we see what's coming but uh, they have i haven't seen relationships start to develop by this point like i had in season one you know season Mm -hmm. one we were already sort of seeing some of the some of the side stories develop those relationships that josh and melissa to let develop separately at what and then start you know the that sort of brought them back together so i'm i'm waiting to see where their story takes them on that quest to find happiness yeah, that's true we haven't really seen that yet uh and i do think it does feel a little rushed i can see that because they only have six episodes i kind of wish they had nine or ten uh so that it could breathe a little bit uh but uh but i guess that's probably partly these you know these actors are super busy so that's that's probably part of the reason but yeah yeah, so that actually reminded me with what he was just saying what adam was just saying was during the number when she's auditioning the dance number which was obviously a chorus line yeah um, my husband had never seen a chorus line and so he was like what exactly is going on here and so i was explaining to him that 
you know, a chorus line really, that's all it is, is we get little snippets of everyone who's auditioning's life stories. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there's not exactly any kind of plot. It's just everyone auditioning for a show and you get a little moment to know what it's like to be someone in the chorus of a show. And I said, so that's kind of what they're trying to do there. Um, But yeah, that one was one in particular where I was like, this is really written for someone who loves musicals and loves something like a chorus line and knows exactly what it is. But if not, then you're like, so I get like five seconds of knowing this person's backstory for two minutes and then it's just gonna end again why you know (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, it it felt it felt to me like this these two episodes were a lot more music heavy than you know the first season Mm -hmm. was you know it felt like they were trying they were doing a lot of the storytelling through the song and i I, you know like Marin said that's sort of that what that genre that era of musical did was tell the stories through the song but you know, in the first go round, we we spent a lot of time sort of in dialogue and, and the songs were there supplementing. And this one just feels like we're sort of trying to get, okay, here's another song, here's another song, here's another song. And then there's a few minutes of dialogue in here. And, you know, I hope that as we go, we get to see some of these stories, not necessarily even from the dancers, but from Mr. You know, from Mr. Cat or, or Krat or, mm-hmm. you know, things like, what's the backstory between, behind these people? You know, you felt... You felt something from Jenny Banks in the little bit in her apartment where she's talking to Melissa um, about, you know, her relationship with Mr. Kratt. You felt right. like something more coming. And so right. I hope that we get to see some of that and start to start to figure it out. But it just it, it felt like we were we were more worried. It almost felt like it was sort of moving more towards a, like a Gilbert and Sullivan type of thing with almost an operetta with so much song and very little dialogue. Well, we haven't even gotten to the Kristen Chenoweth character, the Alan Cumming characters and everything. So yeah, there still seems to be so much more to get into with the next four episodes. So yeah. Well, and I just thought Aaron Tavette was so funny as Tover. Like I've never (laughs) seen hair. That's probably my biggest uh, blind spot is that I haven't seen very many of those like hippie ones. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh and but I didn't need to it was just obvious nope. like his character was like a hippie character and so it was just it, it was really funny I thought he was great yeah I don't think you need to see hair to catch all the references there yeah yeah <laughs> uh and the whole press conference was really funny I thought uh that uh <laughs> he's like what uh can it, it can only be blamed on jazz shameless music mixed with liquor yep <laughs> and then I'll drink to that yep that and that's fun. actually there is a there's a press conference in chicago where they like basically make the um female characters seem like they're dummies and the male lawyer um basically parrots their words and almost does blame everything on jazz and liquor so it, it it's very very funny mm-hmm. yeah but, yeah and uh you know, this is not about you tofer <laughs> it's not about you <laughs> on the busting out song i thought that was fun uh, they were saying in the in the article that that was an homage to you could drive a person crazy from company yeah. i didn't hear that i didn't feel yeah. that yeah it's just you know how in the, in the beginning of you could drive a person crazy they do the do 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 so oh. it was more in the musicality of it okay and the wording of it okay that makes sense that makes sense so we have jamie camel back as sergeant R- rivera uh and you know, don't stick your pretty little nose where you don't belong <laughs> uh and uh so we'll i think we'll get to see more of him uh in this uh after this we just get introduced to his character and then we get Anne harada back as madame frau and we have melissa's trying to uh trying to uh, find a way to get him out and uh, and then she ends up changing in the room with the murder that the murder ended up happening. And that's when you get the 17 quick street and the doorway to where uh, right. with Josh would, he's there with all the hippies. And uh, that was very funny. I enjoyed that. I did just get to see God. I guess the, one of those things I did just get to see God's bell at BYU. So that was pretty fun. Yeah. And see, and that's where you're ahead of me because I have never seen a production of God's bell. Because yeah. it, I think BYU is the only place I've ever heard of it done in Utah ever, and I yeah. couldn't get down there just because of family things and whatever. Mm-hmm. So I, yeah, I, yeah, I don't, the, I mean, I, it. I was kind of shocked to see it yeah. done at BYU, uh, <laughs> yeah, but 
<laughs> yeah, but uh, the the first season, the first act was a little messy. I thought. Um, I mean, they did a good job with it, but because uh, it, it's all the parables. But when they get to the second act, where it's like pretty much strictly Christ's story, I mm-hmm. thought it worked a lot better. Uh, but it was still they did a, a great job, uh, and I, I enjoyed it. And it's nice to just have check off another one off my bucket list. And yeah, and the I actually got to see a chorus line last year at this empress theater where i saw a company mm-hmm. uh and i really appreciate the fact that they do more sort of challenging uh challenging shows like that yeah uh, every every once in a while and uh and so i was really glad to get to see finally you know get to see that but because the movie isn't very good right <laughs> uh but uh yeah so that's this uh episode i i thought it was i thought it was pretty fun uh and I would probably give it mm, a seven, seven point five, maybe. I think I'd give it a seven point five. Uh, what would you give it, Adam? Um, this one, this one was, I think, a little, uh, a little harder for me, just because it was it felt like it was jumping around so much. Yeah. You know, kind of play detective, and I didn't feel like we sort of got it. there was some hidden stuff that I feel like is coming. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of in that 6.57 range mm-hmm. for this one too. Um, you know, I sort of tend to want to look back and judge it as a whole because it is one story. Sure. But you know, I love the I love the characters and and the, you know, like I said, I having having directed Bye Bye Birdie, I loved the the Conrad that reference. Was fun. <laughs> jail, especially when he says, "I didn't touch that girl," I promise, because yep. that's another one of those themes that Marin touched on that you know we see Bye Bye Birdie and we think it's this happy-go-lucky story and we don't think about the fact that, you know, here's this obviously adult person who's going off to going off to war or whatever, war, yeah. you know, coming mm-hmm. into a town and, and falling in love with a little teenager. Yep. You know? so yeah, we don't well, and that stuff. we just think about the fun songs and the, you know, things like that. And it's only, it's only on my mind because when I directed that musical, I did it in American Fork and it was kind of ultra conservative area. And yeah. I got, I got lambasted for the Rosie number being, you know, how dare you, you put on a song that talks about rape culture and all this stuff. And I was like, <laughs> wow, you know, we, we even pumped it down quite a bit. But It is so I'm funny. Up. The things we get lambasted for around <laughs> here. Cause we got, I was in nonsense and we got so many complaints about nonsense. And what was funny is that the show, the theater that I was, I did nonsense in, that they had done just before that got no complaints was Mamma Mia. And I'm like, <laughs> wait a second, friends. That's funny. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, the, I did uh, Bobby Birdie when I was in high school. So I do have a great fondness for it, but I, I saw it fairly recently and the, the, the mother characters just, Oh, she's a lot, mm-hmm. a lot. Just so yeah. racist. And like, there's only so many times you can laugh at a character being racist. <laughs> like, I, yeah, I did. I did Bye Bye Birdie in college, and it's Ooh. the same thing. You like you, you have a fondness from being in it, but at the same time, you just can't like turn a blind eye to so many of the themes, <sighs> whatever. Because you laugh because it's so awkward that it, mm-hmm. it laughs, but like it's not good. Yeah. Uh, if that makes sense, but I don't know. I mean, I still love the show, but that's that. Ooh. If they did a rev, rev, I, I there's certain shows where I hope they do a revival because I'm like, oh, so then they can I rewrite can take it. that out. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's you. interesting. It's interesting to think back on. You know, you talked about that song. Do, do we shock you? Yeah. So, you said in Josh and Melissa, are like, no, no, no. But you think about some of the shows, you know, then that were shocking and, and the the storylines, and now you look back and you go, well, you know, shows like The Mikado now. Mm-hmm. Or, or um, you know, thoroughly modern Millie with these with these Oriental characters. Who oh are yeah, idiots. I mean, those are the kind of things that shock us now. That's true. It, you know, yeah. at the time, we're sort of not even you know not even looked on as shocking and weird. You know, they they just were that was the way yeah. it was. You well, know, and like, the thoroughly modern Millie is kind of shocking because it hasn't been that long since it had a revival, and they kept all that in. Yep. <laughs> like, whoa. But I do want to add, I thought the costuming was really strong in this episode. I especially loved the uh, jailbreak, the doorway to wear outfits. Yes. Uh, they were so cool. They yes. I, I thought, the co- I think the costuming is really fun. This whole, both episodes, I yeah. think the costuming is fantastic. Yeah. 
So yeah, I love the I love the black and white in yeah, the in the really in good. The, the trio that they did. Yeah. Well, very good. Let us know uh, if uh, if let us know if you're listening what you would give these two episodes and what you thought of them. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And uh, Marin, where can people find you? Um, I am most of my writing is at Utah Theater Bloggers. I do. I am on Facebook and Instagram. I don't even know what my Instagram handle is. Probably just Marin Swenson. Yeah, <laughs> put it like in the description. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I am on TikTok. My daughter reminded me last time I'm on it, TikTok. It's Doc Broadway. Oh, cool. Yeah, good. I'll put that in the description too. And uh, I don't think Adam, you didn't ha- have any social media you want to share, right? Yeah, I'm on. Good. I'm on Facebook primarily. I do. I do get on Instagram though more as a lurker than as a poster. <laughs> okay, and, good. And I am aware of TikTok. <laughs> I have kids that are, you know, that are of the age of the TikTok generation, but I just have, I have no reason. I'm not yeah. looking to showcase myself, so I have no reason to get on there yet. But. Yeah. You're better off. It's, it's a lot. It's, you know, it's, Facebook, it's very addicting. It is. Yeah. Facebook and Instagram are the are the same handle. You can find me at AQ Cannon. Great. Uh, you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. And you can also find me at Utah Theater Bloggers. I'm going to be doing two reviews this week. Uh, yay. So yay. Yeah. I'm doing hairspray and fun home. So that'll be fun. Very cool. Uh, I just did um, at um, Weber state. They just, they do at the end of the year, they do something called innovations theater where all okay. of the students write and direct and costume and everything, all their shows. And my goodness, these kids, I tell you what, theater education in Utah is amazing. So yeah, if anyone gets a chance to go up there, it'll be this whole weekend too. Weber State University has got a great theater education program. Very, oh, that's impressive. so cool. I saw that. Yeah, that looks really interesting. Yeah, it said um, Fun Home is at Wasatch Theater Company and uh, uh, Hairspray is at the Eccles. It's only going to be there a couple of days. So, yeah. but uh, but anyway, I love that show. So. Uh, you can find all my stuff there and also at the Hallmarkies podcast. And uh, thanks so much to both of you. And uh, we'll talk to y'all later. Bye, everyone.